Hi guys, this is your maths guru, Jerry, speaking to you about complex numbers. Now, this is the third time I've talked on this lecture today um, using the piece of shit software that DCU is making me use. So hopefully this piece of shit is going to record now and um, actually do something like it's told to. It's the worst platform, God's sake. So um, yeah, I'm going to stop after maybe 15 minutes and try and save it. And uh, so this lecture is going to be a little bit disjointed because I can't trust the, the platform. All right, great. So um, we talked about this, we started talking about this last day. I want to kind of introduce this again more fully now. It's about complex numbers and complex numbers are really important in an engineering context, although they don't exist, which is bizarre. All right, so this, it's a mathematical construct. It's a construct of our minds, yet has, this construct has uses in the real world. It, it's very useful in certain situations in modeling real systems, engineering systems, which is bizarre. And it all comes from um, solving quadratic equations, which is even more ridiculous. All right, so let's let's look at the uh, a problem here. My pen <laughs> as well. Uh, I'm gonna just switch pens and see if that works. Okay, so this that says solve x squared minus x minus six is equal to zero. All right. So uh, this is the state of the art of mathematics in about 1300s in, in Renaissance Italy. This is where this is what they could do. Just this. Okay, they could do a lot of geometry. They were very good at geometry. You know, the things like uh, Pythagoras' theorem, proving that, and all proving all those theorems that we did that you did for the junior sir. All that kind of stuff they were very good at. <clears throat> but they had nothing else. God love them. <coughs> the stupid pants and stupid shirts and and this. That's this is all they could do. Um, but nonetheless, so this is this is actually very very clever. When you think about it, solving quadratic equations, you're, you're you're taught this form in school, in secondary school, and you just you think nothing of it. But when you think about it, where did this formula come from? It's actually an amazing construct. Actually, it's an amazingly clever thing to come up with because it's not obvious where the formula comes from. But the formula, as we know, um, is x is equal to it's minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus four ac all over two a. So in this case, uh, minus b, uh, b is minus one, so minus b is one, plus or minus the square root of b squared, which is one, minus four a, which is one, and c, which is minus six, all over two. And that is one plus or minus the square root of 25 over two. So you get x then is three and minus two. And what does that mean? <clears throat> it means that if you substitute in three, into the uh, original equation, and an equation, if you, if you think about it, is just some expression involving a variable equal to zero. If I substitute three into this expression here, I'm going to get zero equal to zero. That's what solving an equation means. It means that if I replace the variable by uh, a number and I get zero equal to zero, that number is said to be a solution. Okay, so when you plug in three, you get nine minus nine, which is zero. And if you plug in minus two, you get four, uh, four uh, plus two, which is six minus six is equal to zero. So it all works. And that was fine, and everyone was happy enough with that, um, and, and very pleased with themselves uh, coming up with this formula, actually, which is, it, it is quite, very clever. Um, and then they were looking at um, different quadratic equations, and there was ones that they kind of fell down on. So if we wanted to solve this one now, um, Two x squared plus two x plus five is equal to zero. And we're using our formula here. We get x is equal to minus b, so it's minus two plus or minus the square root of four minus four by two by five all over four. And that gives you minus two plus or minus the square root of minus 36 over four. And they came to a grinding halt here because they knew Remember what a square root is. Square root is saying uh, is the square root of a number is the number that you must multiply by itself in order to get that number. Okay, and they knew that you couldn't multiply two numbers together and get a negative number because the number is either positive or negative. If it's positive, you're going to get a positive number. If it's negative, you're going to get a positive number. So you can't get the square root of minus 36. And what they did was, I think this this is just brilliantly clever, really. They said, forget about it. Let's just go and see where this goes. Okay, let's push this as far as we can. So can I just come up here and, and, and do that? Let me look at the square root of minus 36. I can write that as the square root of minus one multiplied by 36. All right, that's, I can do that. That's 
exactly the same. Um, this is the power of a half, the square root is the power of a half. And if I've got two numbers multiplied together, I can bring the power into each of the individual terms. So I get the square root of minus one by the square root of 36. And sorry guys, this is just unbelievably bad here. Look, I'm gonna skip over down here. So I'm gonna get the square root of minus one by six. Okay. Now, we don't know what the square root of minus one is, but let's call it something. And what people call it is um, I, because it doesn't exist. It's completely imaginary. You see what I did there? So therefore, um, we are going to call this expression the square root of minus one. We're going to call that I, and we're going to get six I here. And so if you come down here, then you get minus two plus or minus six I over four. All right, so that's what you get. If you do that, if you s s take the square root of a negative number, break it up into two parts underneath the square root, it's minus one times the, po the positive number, and then take the square root of each of the two terms, you naturally end up with um, what's called a complex number. And what's really nice about complex numbers, folks, is that from the simple beginnings, you get a whole theory, and the whole theory actually naturally flows. It really does flow from this kind of solution to quadratic equations. And that's, that's really, really nice. Okay, pardon me a second while I'll check to see if this thing is, is recording. Okay, I'm gonna loom over the screen here. All right, it seems to be working. We'll see. And um, the last time I, I, I did this, I was talking for 45 minutes and it seemed to be working and then I pressed stop and then it says, oops, something seems to have gone wrong. <laughs> All right, that's the frustration of my voice. Okay, but here's, here's, what, here's what happens, folks. Look, if you look at this, 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 this scenario now, what you have is you have, um, naturally the structure of a complex number arising from the solution of a quadratic equation. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna generalize. Whoa, because I'm gonna look, look uh, from this, 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 this um, quadratic equation, I'm getting a minus two over four plus or minus six over four times i. So I'll see that, look, it's every complex number therefore, and usually complex numbers are written as z. A complex number then is Z is equal to X plus I, Y, where X is a real number, Y is a real number, and in mathematics you put X is a real number, Y is a real number, and I is the square root of minus one, or I squared is equal to minus one. And that's sometimes, that's probably more useful actually, because you see I squared popping up a lot. So every complex number can be written like that. Z is equal to X plus I, Y. And if you look at the complex number solution that we got from the quadratic equation, you will see that there's a natural, another complex number associated with any given complex number. And it's called the conjugate, because if you look at the solution to the quadratic equation, you see it's a number plus or minus a number times i. Okay, so there's a very, very natural association of another complex number with any given complex number. And the other complex number that you associate with the given complex number is called a complex conjugate. And the complex conjugate has its own notation. It's Z bar. And all it is, if this is Z, Z bar then is X minus I Y. Okay, so what you get essentially is you get two complex numbers for the price of one equation. And they're naturally associated with one another. And you have this natural structure. If this is the solution to a quadratic equation, the conjugate is also a solution to the quadratic equation, which is really, really nice. X, the non-i term is called the real part of Z. And the y term, not the yi, but just the number multiplying the i, is called the imaginary part of Z. So the real part of Z, And in mathematics, that's denoted by RE of Z is equal to X. And the imaginary part is INZ and it's Y. So the imaginary part of Z is Y. But be very careful with this, guys. Um, it's not YI, it's the number multiplying the I. So for example, Z is equal to three minus two I. The real part of Z here is three. The imaginary part of Z is minus two. And Z bar 
is 3 plus 2i. So immediately you have structure just from the solution, just because of the fact that the complex number is a solution to a quadratic equation. And as I say, guys, this is not, um, um, this really happens in mathematics. If you get, to get this, you, 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 saw, you do something and something else naturally follows. And then as I said, my own crappy corner of the research world, which nobody's interested in, sometimes very, very rarely does this happen. I do something and from the initial of doing something, loads of other things follow. Very rarely does it happen. Usually you, I do something and I'm stopped and I'm stumped for things to do. But in this case, we've got a complex solution to a quadratic equation. You get all this stuff here for free, all this structure, all this mathematical arsing around for nothing, essentially. It's just amazing. It really, really is nice. All right. So we've got a complex number. And because you can hear the word number, you might want to do something to the number. And usually when you've got numbers, you would like to add them and multiply them, divide them and subtract them. <clears throat> and let's, let's do that. So um, the first thing I'm going to talk about is just, just a simple like scalar, what I call scalar multiplication. I'm sure that's not correct, but let me just do it anyway. So if, you, if, if Z is um, one minus three I, three Z, is just three minus nine i. Okay, so if I multiply a complex number by a real number, you just multiply the real part by the real number and the imaginary part by the real number. Um, and now you can do something fancy, like well, what about two i z? Whoa! Then what you do is you multiply each of the parts by the two i. So the first part, when I multiply two i by one, I get two i minus six i squared, because it's two by three, which is six. There's a minus sign here, and then i by i gives me i squared. But if you look at this here now, folks, i squared is minus 1. So minus, minus by minus gives you plus. So you get 6 plus 2i. So that's, what, that's, that's the first thing you can do. You can do what's called scalar multiplication. And that's, that's wonderful. That's beautiful. That's what you do. Now, let's do... Um, I'm going to go fancy here. I'm just going to go, just going to go uh, really mathsy on you uh, because I think I'm entitled because it is maths class, I suppose. Um, suppose we want to add two complex numbers. So let's call the first number Z1. And Z1 we know is going to be X1 plus IY1. And Z2 is X2 plus IY2. Okay, so there's two complex numbers. Um, there's going to be a real part and imaginary part in each case. And the imaginary part is going to be multiplied by I. If I want Z1 plus Z2, what do I do? I just, uh, it is an actual kind of thing that you might think of, and it's exactly what you do. You add the real parts, and you add the imaginary parts. Now, there's a reason why you do it, but um, I think it's a pretty natural way of, 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 of thinking of things. Um, if you add two complex numbers, you add the real parts, and then you add the imaginary parts separately. And also, folks, if you have a minus, let me do two for one here. It's exactly the same as x1 minus x2 plus i y1 minus y2. So you subtract the imaginary parts and you subtract the real parts. So let me just do an example. I'm going to stop to make sure this uh, piece of crap platform is doing the actual recording. And um, let me just do an example here. Z1 is 3 minus 2i. Z2 is equal to 4 plus i. Z1 plus Z2, I add the real parts, I get 7. Minus 2 plus 1 is minus i. How about um, Z1 minus Z2 bar? Oh my god, this is so this is so exciting. It's 3 minus 2i minus Z2 bar is 4 minus i. So what you do is, you, it, so this is 3 minus 2i minus 4 plus i. Add the real parts, minus 1. Add the imaginary parts minus i. I subtract the imaginary parts, whichever you want to do. Okay? So that's fairly straightforward, I hope. Um, so adding and subtracting and doing what's called scalar multiplication, what I call scalar multiplication, although I'm sure that's not correct, is, um, is very straightforward. Very, very easy, I think. So don't forget that. Adding and subtracting complex numbers is really easy. And this is the general uh, layout. This is the general method. I'm going to stop now. I'm going to call this lecture 14, part 1. And there's lecture 14, part two, if you can bear the excitement to follow. Okay, guys, in a second, 